Namaste. <laughs> welcome, welcome to our December satsang. All right, first to begin, of course, uh, a commercial. This is now finally available in print. What I showed you last time was a proof copy, but this is now available. Uh, I keep reading it occasionally. I'm truly amazed at the intelligence and the articulation of the people who, who wrote this book. So that's the end of the commercial. So I'll start our timer. However, let's do go back to this. I want to talk to you about the Sasha made God. Now, it's not easy to see, but see what looks like little mushrooms there. They're actually umbrellas, quite large umbrellas, made of a kind of wicker work. This is the distinguishing characteristic of the Sasha made God. Actually, there's only a few there compared to what usually is there. For those of you who will sometime in the future be going to India, um, that's, this is what I want to talk about. All of Benares is sacred. It's truly amazing. I uh, was astounded the first time I went there. It was um, a place like I couldn't imagine. India was a place I couldn't imagine. And then Benares was truly supernatural. And you can get a boat that will take you from the northernmost ghat. Ghat means stairs. It's a place where people go down to get into the water to bathe. Down to the southernmost ghat, which is called the Anandamai ghat, which is there at the Anandamai ashram. Always when I had gone down, I was amazed that at one point on the southern side of the Dasasha made God, I would feel this incredible spiritual current moving out, out to, to the Ganga and over. And I mean, it was incredibly tangible. It was not just, oh, well, that's, that's rather nice. It was just sort of like a few hundred thousand volts of power coming out. And uh, during one trip, I would go there every evening and I would sit there against the wall, the back wall, which is this little light colored space there above my finger. And it was heavenly because it was so peaceful. Sometimes there are about 20 people there, sometimes maybe only about 10 or so. Often people would be singing devotional songs uh, or there would just be this heavenly silence. And uh, it was one of my favorite activities. All right. The secret of the Sasha made God is actually found in chapter 33 of Autobiography of a Yogi. In that chapter, the name is written as the Sasa Maid because the editors did not know how to spell it. And I expect Yogananda never really read over the, the printed copy. So uh, anyway, there it tells about the real secret, which is the presence of Mahavatar Babaji's sister who lives in an underground cave at the Sashamed Ghat. I knew a Supreme Court attorney, by Supreme Court I mean the Supreme Court of India, who <clears throat> before he ever read Autobiography of a Yogi, before he'd ever heard of Yogananda, this Supreme Court attorney went to Banaras one time and he went in the evening to the Sashamed Ghat and uh, this very remarkable woman walked up to him and said, please come with me. So she turned around and started walking away and he followed her. And 
they went through a very convoluted route. And uh, finally, they were far underground, that he could tell. And they came to this area, not a very large area, like underground room. And this yogi was sitting there, is incredibly radiant with what is very unusual for India, bright red hair or copper colored hair. Well, he was so odd that he, he, he didn't think of even speaking to the yogi. He just sat there and looked at him. And then he did ask her quietly, who is this? And she answered, Maha Babaji, Great Babaji, which doesn't mean much because that's not a name at all. But uh, that was all she said, so he took it. And then after a while, she stood up and indicated he should follow her. And so she led him out to the Sasha made God. After he read Autobiography of Yogi, he went there several times trying to see if he could retrace his steps. And of course, he never could. <laughs> when we're dealing with great beings like this, nothing is going to go according to our little petty ideas. So anyway, she is there. There's no reason you can't talk to her in your mind. And there's no reason she couldn't answer you back if she so desires. But her spiritual power is there and is very, very real. And uh, so if you want a really good and living pilgrimage to Benares, this is one of the ways. All right, I have the magic box, hopefully. Oh, okay, well, this is good. This is my first one. Thank you, Rita, very much. Uh, do let me know if you get a question. Uh, and Rita says something very, very nice uh, in appreciation of the satsang. Thank you. All right. Can you point me in the direction of some simple, easy vegetarian recipes? Absolutely right. It's called the Internet. You just simply go on the Internet and you just type in vegetarian recipes or vegan recipes, my preference. And uh, you can put in a word simple and easy if you want to see what you get. There are thousands of vegetarian recipes on the Internet. Our monastery um, published a vegetarian cookbook some years ago, which uh, sold very well and was very well appreciated. A major publishing company wanted to take it up and print it under their imprint, and we agreed, and uh, then they folded. So that was the end of that. We've discussed reissuing it, but when it might happen, I wouldn't know. All right. Do the spiritual entities within the human body need to evolve? Are we the humans, the vessels for their evolution? If so, why do they need to evolve? Well, I, I'm sorry, I don't remember just what this uh, question is based on. Um, the entities living within our bodies are things like uh, all kinds of bacteria, all kinds of bugs, for example, there are worms that live in our eyebrows. It's a rather a repulsive idea, isn't it? So we're actually a whole little world. And uh, uh, somehow it's all going along together. I suppose each one of us then is the Ishwara of its universe. But I have an idea that the better thing is to simply just stay focused on uh, what we, us, are doing. How difficult is it for one like me to achieve true awakening as in the scriptures and spoken of by the sages? 
isn't difficult at all because you are a sentient being and you're possessed of an immortal divine self. And therefore you are no less qualified to attain to awakening than anyone that's ever been born in the entire history of the human race. So that's it. You don't have to think, how do you qualify? All you need to know is how you do it. And for that, I recommend the book Soham Yoga, the Yoga of the Self. The only awakening is the awakening into yourself, into the pure consciousness that is yourself. Uh, we can be entertained by a lot of utterly worthless experiences, such as I sat and I felt myself expanding and expanding and expanding and out I was and so on and so on. Uh, it's just a fantasy. It's just like a dream. It doesn't mean anything. People have all, oh, I saw the great light of this and I saw that there. Oh, yes, indeed, you know. As a friend of mine used to say, I looked up and found the Buddha walking upside down on my uh, meditation room ceiling. By the way, she was joking. Uh, she didn't really believe that was happening. So indeed, in fact, it says, is it possible to awaken, for want of a better word, and know God instead of merely having psychophysio nice feelings? There certainly is, because those feelings mean nothing. They're not any more important than a feeling you would get if you took a tranquilizer or opium or some other drug. That, that, that is the real fact. Uh, nothing physical induces a metaphysical experience. So you have to start with what you plan to end up with. And that's the process of meditation. Now, the word psychophysio is here. And I will say, if you are involved in fake yoga called Raja Yoga, or calling itself Raja Yoga, for it's not true Raja Yoga, where there's breathing and this and that, and the chakras and so on, well, then you're headed right down the road to delusion because that isn't real yoga at all. That is simply fiddling around with the subtle energy systems of the individual and inducing a hoo-hoo kind of feeling. And then they think, I've got it. I knew a woman that belonged to one of these yoga cults that's very intent on the pranayama and the subtle bodies and so on. She told me very seriously about how she'd been sitting in meditation and suddenly she heard the sound, the divine sound. And she said, I said, at last it's come to me. Oh, at last it's come to me. But then when I listened further and closer, I realized where it was coming from. And it was my refrigerator breaking down. <laughs> oh, that gives you the level of the kind of spiritual organization that woman, and at that time myself, belonged to. Is there anything known about Jesus' guru besides his name? Uh, not really, uh, except, you know, for the fact that he taught Jesus and that when Jesus was crucified, he saw it in vision and he went in subtle body to where Jesus was is after then and Jesus was buried and he entered the other world and helped Jesus in coming back into the body and uh, if you want you can say he resurrected Jesus and uh, then Jesus returned with him to India that's that's just sort of it. It's not very uh, satisfactory, perhaps, but that's all we seem to know. Was Christianity meant to deceive Africans so that the so-called white could take over the wealth of the continent? The so-called Bible is translated into so many African languages. 
Slavery has been with us, unfortunately, uh, from prehistory. The evil idea that one human being can own another is just that, evil. It's a terrible evil. It shows a brutish mentality, even though the slave takers usually consider themselves to be the superior culture or the superior civilization, but they weren't. And this has gone on long before, long before there was a Bible, long before there was Christianity. You can't blame the Bible or Christianity for this terrible disease. However, there is an interesting aspect. As much as I've been able to determine, and I'm not exactly a great authority, India has never engaged in slavery. And I don't know of a single civilization, ancient and contemporary, that in their roots did not have slaves. And so this is very, very interesting to me that we did not find in India that the people made slaves of each other. That's, that's no small thing. I'll tell you another small, not small thing is that India was the only culture that from ancient times believed in shocha, in purity, and frankly, took baths and didn't live like pigs, mostly because they didn't eat pig's flesh, so they didn't live like pigs. They were vegetarian, which is part of the ultimate thing of purity. Putting some dead body inside you is just about the dirtiest thing uh, you can think of. So anyway, um, Jesus was sold for 30 pieces of silver. Do you know what that was? That was the standard price of a slave at the time of Jesus. So slavery certainly predates Christianity. And Jesus was, in a sense, sold like a slave. This was part of his total unity with the entire human race. There was no aspect that he didn't take up of himself. Okay, fine. Uh, where do unwanted thoughts come from? Well, from our own mind, mostly. And that has to do with our some scars, you see. The fact we've lived previous lives. All the minds you ever possessed are right kind of up here in a way, in your mind. So uh, the mind you had when you were a thief that used to break into other people's houses and steal is there. The mind you had when you were a mercenary soldier and you went out and killed both for money and for the enjoyment of it, it's there. Uh, the mind that you possessed when you were yourself an incredibly immoral, indecent person, it's there. So, when you start turning within, the ghosts come up and say, ooh, guess who I was or guess who you were. Now, we like to blame it on spirits, and it's true, spirits are all around us. There are good spirits and there are evil spirits, there are stupid spirits, there are intelligent spirits. Some are human spirits, that is, they've been human beings. Some have never been human beings. <clears throat> Mostly, they don't bother putting thoughts in their head because, well, think, would you like to hang around you and put thoughts in your head if you were another person? Couldn't you find something more interesting to do? even if it's only going out and looking at the mountains and the sea. But there are evil spirits who do try to urge us to evil thought patterns because they are addicted to it, you see. 
They're addicted to doing it, but they no longer have a body to do it with. But they can observe it. Must you feel the sensation you feel when <clears throat> you do these things? I've known people that remember that, at, that when they were cigarette addicts, after their death, they hung around people urging them subliminally to smoke cigarettes. A lot of drug addiction comes from this, from entities. And a lot of indecent behavior comes from these entities. You have these people, they're going along, right, right, and suddenly they discover their sexuality. It's nonsense. Some perverted spirit started saying, hey, guess the possibilities of what you could do. And they feel like an urge. And of course, maybe they did engage in that. But ultimately, it is all from us. And if we would meditate, and if we would keep Japa going, spirits like that won't want to be with us in the same room. You have, I, I remember talking to a, a group of monks at the Monastery of St. Pacomius in Aswan. And uh, I was talking with him about meditation, about interior life. And because one of the favorite things that subverted Christianity like is glorifying the devil and talking about ooh, evil spirits and be afraid and they're here, they're there, they're everywhere. And so one of the monks said, oh, why don't you talk about the fact that evil spirits will attack you when you do these things? And I said, if you do these things correctly that I'm telling you, they won't be able to be in the same room with you. They'll have to stand about 50 feet away and they'll yell at you and they'll threaten you and they'll tell you they're going to kill you and they'll tell you they're going to pull you down into hell. But all you do is say, oh, be off with you. You're not anything. That's the truth. That is the, the, the very much the truth. But the problem is we have to be so careful when we try to put the blame outside us. Because you see, if there wasn't something negative in us, they wouldn't be attractive to us and they wouldn't have an affinity with us. It's like radio broadcasts. If you dot tuned into the right wavelength, you don't get it. So ultimately, ultimately, there we are. The real thing is us. What's the major problem? We are. You see? This is... Uh, Definitely, definitely the truth. All right, I have two big questions. One, a big, very much in sense of import. <clears throat> and the other in, in things that yogic phenomena, things that do happen. And uh, we'll certainly be talking about them. All right, here we are. Shivananda states that Soham is the mantra of the Paramahansas, Paramahansa Swamis. In other words, there's different levels of sannyasis and sadhus. And the Paramahansas are of the highest. They usually don't even wear any clothes, which means they don't have any pockets, which means they can't own anything and carry it around with them. And these hopefully having the highest mentality, then their approach is the realization of the non-duality, not just of their nature, but of everything, because God is not separate from them. <clears throat> All right. So I feel that sannyasins are more jnana-oriented and they're perfect brahmacharis and perfect veganists. Mm -hmm. 
The question is for householders, don't we also need a more bhakti-oriented sadhana? No, because most so-called bhakti is nonsense. It's just emotion. Shivananda said over and over again, devotion is not emotion. Shivananda, all right, who's being cited here. So the idea like, uh, yeah, in other words, I don't want to be smart. I don't want to be a jnana yogi and have my mind functioning because I might have to look at myself in the mirror and see myself for what I am. So I'm a devotee. So though I have falls and though I be, be, be I love God. Sure you do. <laughs> All right. Therefore, let us ask Swami Shivananda about it. Okay? Swami Shivananda. Not me. Swami Shivananda. He put out a little booklet. In 1937, see? practice of Japa Yoga, meaning mantra, meditation, Japa based on mantra. 1937, all right? Printed for free distribution. He wrote it, he didn't write it for the West to read at all, in fact, actually, but I hope. That will not be considered a reason to ignore what he says. If you are a very busy man, and if you lead a traveling life, always, okay? Now there's people say, well, I come home, the children cry, they make noise, blah, blah, may my wife nags me, or there's this and that, the neighbor has his radio on too loud, you know, you know. But he says, if you're always traveling, which means you have no house, you have no home, and you're busy, very busy man, he says. In other words, day and night, you're, you are acting, you're carrying on your business, and you're traveling for that. Okay? You need not have a special room and a special time for meditation. Do soham japa and dhyana along with the breath. This is very easy. Then every moment of breath will become a prayer and meditation. Remember soham. Feel his presence everywhere. This will suffice. He's talking to a busier person than anybody, I'm sure, that's present at this satsang. And that's what he says to do. Now, if you like, from self-knowledge, Swami Shivananda, right? Let, let's pay attention to what he has to say. His book, Self-Knowledge. Do a japa japa. The prana will be absorbed in the nada. All the vritis will perish. Do soham japa and soham dhyana along with the breath. This is very easy. Remember soham. Feel his presence everywhere. This will suffice. I've never read anywhere that this book, self knowledge, was printed to be read only by sadhus. Okay, now, yoga in daily life. Now that tells you he's talking about so called ordinary people, though no yogi is ordinary. Soham dhyana is nirguna, nirakara meditation, without form. Soham means I am that. This is associated with the breath. Repeat so when you inhale and hum when you exhale. This is easy. This is known as a japa japa. Feel that you are the all pervading pure consciousness when you think of soham. The source for this breath is Brahman or Atman. You're identical with that source and reality. Okay. okay, all right, continuing. Meditation on Soham is Nirguna meditation, meditation on the formless Brahman. Good. In Kundalini Yoga, he says, with the mantra Soham, the sadhaka leads the jivatma, leads the jivatma into the heart. You do it. 
with Soha. You unite yourself with yourself. Okay, mind its mysteries and control. Concentrate on the breath with Soham repetition. Sadhana, a big book about that thick, which is really a masterpiece. It's one of the, in fact, I think it was printed after his uh, Ma Samadhi. Soham means he am I or I am Brahman. So means he, aham means I. This is the greatest of all mantras. This is an Abeda Bodha Vakya, that is. It is beyond just the body and is the enlightened principle, the Bodhi within us, in sound form, Vakya, which signifies the identity of the Jiva or the individual self and Brahman or the Supreme Self. This mantra comes in the Ishavasha Upanishad Soham Asmi. I'm Soham. Recognize your own Swarupa by negating the body idea and identifying yourself with the Supreme Self. Mentally always repeat Soham. Meditate on Satchitananda, the non dual Brahman, and you do it through Soham. Watch the breath with silent Soham repetition while sitting, standing, eating, talking. This is an easy method for concentration. The Soham Bhava, which means the very state of consciousness indicated by Soham, must become habitual. Okay, a book, Easy Steps to Yoga. Let every breath sing the song of infinity and eternity with Soham. Okay. Practical lessons in yoga. He wrote a lot of books and see what he put in a lot of books. Soha means I am he. The breath is reminding you of your identity with the Supreme Soul. Negate the body while repeating the mantra and identify yourself with the Atma or the Supreme Soul. And he's doing, you do it through Soha. Okay, okay fine. I'm sorry to tell you, I found this and then didn't write the name of the book, but this is from Shivananda. Sing the song of Soham. He didn't mean, da -da 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 -da, but he, he means it inwardly. Then only you can be in tune with the infinite. Then only can you hear the soundless voice of the soul and enjoy the sweet internal music of the Atma. Believe me, those who practice Soham Sadhana, they'll experience exactly what he's saying. Definitely. There's no doubt. So that's Swami Shivananda. And having lived with him, I thoroughly believe he knew what he was talking about. Hmm. All right. Now, this is an important question, a lengthy question. Over the last 20 years or so, I've had a perplexing problem related to my meditation practice. It generally happens three or four times a week. I'll be sitting quietly meditating, and then when I reach a relatively deep state of concentration, suddenly a crack, uh, C-R-A-C-K, capital letters, happens. And it was a sound. It's very loud, almost like a firecracker, or someone doing a loud hand clap right next to your ear. It seems to come from the walls, corners of the room, or the ceiling. I've distinctly noticed that it comes only at the high point of concentration. I have yet to experience samadhi, so this is relative. Well, understand, samadhi is beyond a lot of the phenomenal things that they talk about. You don't breathe and you don't have heartbeat when you're dead. And I haven't noticed that people come back to the next life with realization, having experienced the breathless and thoughtless state, have you? So don't listen to a lot of this phony, corny yoga talk. Okay, this is, forgive me. Uh, I'm not laughing at you, Michael. 
I contacted another spiritual teacher who had written briefly in one of her books about the, quote, cracking in the walls and asked her if she knew what was going on. Her reply was that she thought, quote, the archangels are making their presence known to you. Well, that's a pretty poor way of doing it, since crack doesn't tell you anything. I can't really accept this. I hope not. You've got a brain operating in your head. So of course you don't accept this. Why would the archangels make their presence known by making the practitioner lose his concentration? Wouldn't they have a more undisturbing way of saying hello? They would. Okay. More recently, I've wondered if there's a service might be coming for myself, sort of a poltergeist situation. Regardless of the source, I need help to get an understanding of the situation and how to stop it so that I may continue my practice in peace and hopefully eventually attain samadhi or jnana, as the Theravadans call it. Yes. Excellent question. And one thing it says is you're doing something right. We are a complex of many bodies, one of which is sound. And as we go from stage to stage, it's like a switch over, like changing channels sometimes, say on, on, a, on television or, or, or the, turning the dial on the radio. And these things happen, I find, usually when there is a sudden alignment of the subtle energies or a sudden polarization. And it can manifest in different ways, just depending on what's dominant in the yogi's makeup. I sometimes would happen, I'm meditating and then something like that. It was like somebody pulled my head up, my head went like that and locked. I don't mean I felt paralyzed, but it was and alignment was done. It was a sign. I was doing the right thing, and uh, that was kind of it. So you will find different kind of phenomena. Sometimes you'll see a flash of light. Sometimes you'll have a, a sudden feeling, like maybe weightlessness just for a moment. Uh, of themselves, uh, they're no great indication, but it does mean that your bodies are starting to integrate correctly. So it's a good sign. It doesn't mean it has to happen. Uh, for most people, I think it won't happen. But it depends on the energy makeup of our subtle bodies. And uh, it, it, you see, the faculty of sound, the faculty to produce sound and to perceive sound. Uh, itself uh, has a level of sound in it. And so, sorry, I'd love to be specific, but something is happening. <laughs> but something that ought to happen is happening. Uh, as I say, I've known of people who just suddenly, boom, I've known of people who suddenly go bam, their body went to some, uh, was they go to lotus posture? They never could do lotus posture. And they're saying they're meditating, and then suddenly, whoosh, whoosh, it happens. These are also some scars that arise. And I'm sorry, that's as, as much as I can say. I've heard all kinds of sounds and this and that, and I, I understand these things happen. But it'll be often very individual. Of course, the archangel thing, is funny, even though it's also abysmally stupid. You know, that day may not sound nice, but you know something? If you can't call a spade a spade, you may try to dig a hole with a garden rake instead uh, of a hole or a spade. So you need to know what the tool is and you need to put a word to it. Sometimes, you know, 
A lot of negativity disappears just when you put a label on it. It's interesting. That's the way it goes. So I've come down to eight minutes more. And so it says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. So I mercifully will end it. So you no longer have to hear me going on and on. So namaste, namaste, namaste.